welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar today will discuss causes and risk factors of brain tumors. My name is Jill Antimus, Senior Program Manager here at the American Brain Tumor Association. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Jill Barnholt Sloan, PhD. Dr. Barnholt Sloan is an Associate Professor at Case Comprehensive Cancer Center at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. She is a multidisciplinary trained she is multidisciplinary trained in biostatistics, epidemiology, and genetics. Her research focuses on gaining a better understanding of what causes brain tumors and how genetic changes in the tumors are related to clinical outcomes. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Ronald Sloan. You may now begin your presentation. So thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. I want to thank the American Brain Tumor Association and Jillian in particular for inviting me to come and speak with you today about causes and risk factors for brain tumors, which is something that for those of us in the field would call epidemiology or brain tumor epidemiology, and we'll talk a little bit about what that term means. Um, on the slide that you can see, my email address is listed there. So if for some reason your question, we're not able to get to your question today, please feel free to email me and I'll do my best to answer you as promptly as possible. So what is epidemiology? Epidemiology is actually simply just the study of patterns of disease in population. And what we are looking at is we're looking at the proportion of new individuals diagnosed with a certain disease. We're looking at survival. We're looking at factors that cause the disease. We're looking at patterns of treatment. And we're also looking at a variety of other clinical outcomes besides survival. So lots of different studies that you may be interested in looking at. Usually there's an epidemiologist involved in those studies looking at risk factors or survival. I want to show you now a few slides that show you some national statistics for the United States based off of the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States data, or CB Trust. And um, these data are really special because they are gathered from uh, almost all of the states across the United States, 49 states, and are published each year um, and are freely available for you to download that report. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that we've just recently, myself and my team at Case Western have just recently taken over as the scientific group for that, and we've really enjoyed it, our experience so far. And we hope that these statistics provided in this report, and I'm just showing you a smattering of them here, um, are useful and helpful for you. What this is showing you is that brain tumors kind of come in two general groupings. Um, the malignant brain tumors and the non-malignant brain tumors. The malignant brain tumors have been collected um, in the United States since the early 70s at the state level um, into the early 80s is when most states came on board. The, the non-malignant tumors started being collected in about the mid-2000s. And um, what these are showing you is that for children in general, children get a much higher proportion of malignant brain tumors than non-malignant while in adults, they get a much higher proportion of non-malignant as compared to malignant. So when we talk about different types of brain tumors, malignant versus non-malignant, what does that really mean? Um, the most common type of non-malignant brain tumors in adults is a meningioma, and the most common, followed by tumors of the pituitary, and the most common type of malignant brain tumor in adults is a glioblastoma. For children, um, the types of tumors that they get are very different. Um, the most common type of malignant brain tumor that they get is a medulloblastoma, and then they also get a very high proportion of something called a pilocytic astrocytoma, um, which sometimes is classified as malignant and sometimes classified as non-malignant. So in terms of um, the proportion of newly diagnosed cases in the United States, and that's what incidence is. Incidence, an incidence rate is the proportion of newly diagnosed cases. You can, this graph is showing you um, how, 
based on the different types of tumors that we just talked about. So if you just focus on the sort of light blue line with the squares, that's showing you how um, the proportion of newly diagnosed cases changes as someone gets older. And so you can see that meningiomas um, are relatively uncommon in individuals less than 45, and they become more common as you get older. And that's really true for um, not just for brain tumors, but for most cancers, that um, most cancers become more common as one would get older. And there's lots of reasons for why that happens, and that's kind of a more of a cancer biology focused talk, but if you have questions about that, I'd be happy to answer you offline or to chat with you. Um, this slide just shows some, some of the same data, the incidence of the proportion of newly diagnosed cases um, by age again, but this is just showing you the, the most common types of childhood brain tumors. And so, again, you can see that the, um, the blue line, the pilocytic astrocytoma, and um, the green line, the medulloblastoma, are the two most common um, brain tumors in, in children, irregardless of, of um, age group. That red line is sort of showing you um, what, what we would call all other gliomas, which means it's kind of a mishmash of um, all the different types of glial tumors that one could get. So that was why I, I'm more focused on the pilocytic astrocytoma, the blue line, and the medulloblastoma, the green line. So um, this, again, just shows you the same information in a little bit of a different way, so in a tabular form versus a figure. And what it's showing you is the most common type of brain tumor and the second most common type of brain tumor by age group. And um, so again, the embryonal tumors for children ages 0 to 4 include the medulloblastoma. And so you can see that um, for adults, again, it's meningiomas and glioblastomas are the most common. And for children, it's the embryonal tumors. The most common type is the medulloblastoma or the pilocytic astrocytoma. So what about what causes brain tumors? I, I imagine that this is a question um, I know that I ask myself as a researcher, and I can only imagine that many of you have asked yourself. And I wish that I could tell you that I have an answer for you in terms of a risk factor that um, explains a large amount of brain tumors. Unfortunately, I don't have that answer for you. I wish I did. Um, and it's not for lack of trying. I'll show you a list of all the different things that we've studied um, over the last few decades, trying to gain a better understanding of what causes brain tumors with the hopes that we could then prevent it. Um, but in terms of the main risk factors that we believe to be true, and when I say we, um, there is a group of brain tumor epidemiologists that um, has joined together in an organization called the Brain Tumor Epidemiology Consortium. And these are the, when we get all of us together, all the experts in the room, these are the risk factors that we believe to be true. So um, ionizing radiation to the head or neck does cause an increase in, in brain tumor risk. And if you have allergies or asthma, it causes a decrease in your risk for brain tumors. Um, so in terms of unproven causes of brain tumors, and maybe some of these things on this list are things that you have um, thought about or worried about, um, there's a long list of things on this list, uh, as you can see. And these are all um, factors that have been studied in multiple studies where the results have been um, inconclusive. So the results have not shown them to be risk factors for brain tumors. And I'm going to go through some of these a little bit more specifically. I think um, especially the ones that have gained a little more attention in the, in the newspapers, in the scientific literature in recent years. So um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about ionizing radiation to the head or neck um, as a definitive risk factor for brain tumors, just to explain to you a little bit where this information comes from and, and why we believe this true. Um, so there are two very, very large studies that have provided us very good evidence um, that um, ionizing radiation 
is a risk factor for brain tumors. And the first most conclusive study is a study um, of a group of individuals who were um, immigrating to Israel in the 1950s. And they came in family groups. And um, at the time, a lot of them had something called tinea capitis, which is a very fancy Latin term for ringworm of the cell. And it's a highly contagious infection. And at the time, the um, thought in terms of the standard treatment for tinea capitis was to radiate someone's head. Um, thankfully, now they realize that that's not the right treatment. Um, but at the time, that was what they were doing. And what happened was is that many of these children and adults were radiated. And what they did was they followed these individuals for more than 40 years. And what they found is that there's a fourfold increased risk of meningioma in these individuals who received radiation for tinea capitis, and about a twofold increased risk of any type of glioma. Now, another study that you would think would, where individuals would get a very large exposure to ionizing radiation would be the atomic bomb study. And they followed almost 80,000 atomic bomb survivors over time to, and followed them to see what sort of diseases they got. And they don't seem to get, thankfully, brain tumors. Um, a lot of them, interestingly enough, get thyroid tumors. So there's a very high rate of thyroid tumors in that population. In addition, um, to go along with that as to why we believe ionizing radiation to be a risk factor for brain tumors has to do with studies of children with cancer. And so um, these are, as a group, generally called childhood cancer survivor studies. And there is a very large study in the United States. There's also a very, another very large study in Europe and Great Britain. And um, what these studies show is that for children who received ionizing radiation um, of some sort, that they have an increased risk of a glioma. And um, they've also looked at CAT scans and how many CAT scans um, the children have had and as they get to be adults whether or not it increases their risk of glioma. And there's also evidence that, it, that the amount of CAT scans they've had is associated with, um, again, which is, which is radiation, um, associated with their risk of cancer, including brain tumors. So what about dental x-rays and brain tumor risk? There's a study, which maybe some of you are familiar about, that have came out um, about a year and a half ago that showed that having dental x-rays on a yearly basis or greater was associated with an increased risk of meningioma. Again, I think it's important to keep in mind that although um, these studies do show some evidence of association between dental x-rays and brain tumor risk, um, these studies are asking people to remember back to when they were children as to how many dental x-rays they had and what type of dental x-rays they had. And I think that many times, um, you know, we try our very best to remember things that happened a long time ago, but maybe sometimes we don't remember as accurately as we would like. And so you just have to keep that in mind when you look at some of this evidence here for dental x-rays and brain tumor risk that this is all based on something called recall, okay? And so it's, it's all dependent on how accurate the recall was of each person that they were asking these questions. So what about allergies and brain tumor risk? This is really interesting because um, we have now shown, been able to show over and over and over again that if you have allergy or some other allergic condition like eczema, psoriasis, or asthma, that it decreases the risk of glioma. And some of the reason are, are the belief, the biological hypothesis possibly behind this is, is that when you have allergies, your body is like on constant surveillance, right, because of the um, allergic reaction in you. It's sort of in heightened awareness mode. And maybe it's possible that because it's in heightened awareness mode, that it also can um, get rid of other things 
such as possibly like the beginnings of a cancer cell. And what about cell phones? I think that cell phones have really um, gained the most attention uh, over time in terms of the potential association with brain tumors. And I absolutely understand why individuals would think that cell phones could potentially be related to brain tumors because most of us hold the cell phone right up next to our head. And most of us, when we hold the cell phone, we hold it predominantly with one hand on one side of our head. And I don't know about you, but I'm right-handed, so I'll typically hold my cell phone with my left hand, hold it up to my left side of my head because I want to be able to use my right hand. And so a lot of these studies have looked at um, handedness, and they've asked questions about um, are you right-handed or left-handed, which side of the um, which side of your head do you hold the phone to? Because obviously, um, if you're going to get the exposure, it's based on where the phone is, you know, on what side of your head it's on. Uh, these data are just um, the most updated data that I could find showing you the number of cell phone subscriptions per 100 people. So you can say the blue line is in the developed countries, which is the United States would be considered a developed country that in 2013 there were 128 cell phone prescriptions per every 100 people, which essentially I think means that most of us have more than one cell phone is what it boils down to. And so um, how do we, you know, kind of think about uh, investigating whether or not cell phones could possibly be related to brain tumor risk? One of the ways that we think about that is, okay, if, if People are starting to use brain tumors at an increased rate. Um, ooh, sorry. So again, if the rate of use of in the rate of use of cell phones is increasing rapidly, and cell phones are are associated with brain tumor risk, then we should also see that incidence or the proportion of newly diagnosed brain tumors is increasing. Okay, and there's no clear evidence of that. So I'll say that again. So even though use of cell phones is increasing rapidly, there is no rapid increase in the proportion of brain tumors who are diagnosed. Okay? And so if cell phones truly were a risk factor for brain tumors, we would expect that brain tumors would be increasing with increasing use of cell phones. Okay? And there have been multiple studies in both the United States and all across um, the sort of um, Western Europe that have looked at this relationship between cell phone use and incidence of brain tumors, and no one has found that association to be true. Now, there have been multiple studies which we call case control studies, which is the standard study design that an epidemiologist would, be to, would use to investigate a risk factor, a case would be defined as someone who has the disease of interest, and a control is defined as someone who does not have the disease of interest. And then you ask both the cases and controls questions about different risk factors, and you compare their answers. And that's how you calculate these um, risk rates. And um, so all of these studies listed here on this slide that have looked at glioma, the association of cell phones with uh, risk of glioma, risk of meningioma, and risk of vestibular schwannoma, or sometimes called an acoustic neuroma, um, basically show over and over and over again that there's no increased risk of these uh, types of tumors associated with cell phone use. Now, the one caveat that I can say is that a lot of these studies um, have not been able to look at, because the studies just are not old enough, been able to look at long-term cell phone use. Okay, So in most of these studies, their definition of long-term cell phone use is 10 years or less. And what we don't understand is how long it actually takes a cancer to develop. So does it take 10 years? Does it take 20 years? Does it take 30 years? We don't really have a good understanding of that. And therefore, maybe 10 years is just not enough time to, um, you know, potentially see an association. But 
right now there have been many studies done in the U.S. and throughout Europe, very, very large studies that have included large, large numbers of brain tumor patients and controls, again, the people who, individuals who don't have a brain tumor. And none of these studies have shown definitively that there is an association between cell phones and glioma, cell phones and meningioma, or cell phones and vestibular schwannoma. So just to switch gears a little bit, what about inheritance of brain tumors? Um, so uh, some, one of the forms of cancer that you hear people talk about the most in terms of inheritance is breast and ovarian cancer. And that's because we know um, what, uh, what mutation, so what error in a specific gene called the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene can actually increase your risk for getting those cancers. And um, that is actually an inherited mutation. So you can um, inherit the mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2 from mom or dad. In the case of brain tumors, um, we have done multiple different studies to try to better understand this question as to whether or not brain tumors are actually inherited. So can you actually inherit the risk of a brain tumor from your mom or your dad? What I should say, for all cancers combined, brain tumors included, only about 5% of all of those cancers are actually inherited from mom or dad. Okay? So I'll say that one more time. Inheriting something from mom or dad that can cause you to get cancer only happens about 5% of the time. Okay? All right. So um, we've done multiple different types of studies that have tried to answer this question about inheritance. Now, there are the, the very rare cases where um, there are someone does have an inherited mutation, so for neurofibromatosis 1, that is an inherited mutation in the neurofibromatosis 1 gene, and um, there is a cluster of different um, things that can happen to someone who has that mutation, and included in that cluster of things is the potential risk for development of some very specific types of brain tumors. There are some other uh, inherited syndromes that are very rare um, that uh, where you would also inherit a mutation from, and that mutation would cause you to be at risk for getting brain tumors in combination with multiple other types of cancers. But these are very rare. They're 1 in 4,000 to 1 in 60,000 um, individuals. But there are also other individuals who, when you ask them about their family members and you say, okay, tell me about your mom, tell me about your dad, tell me about your aunts and uncles, tell me about your siblings, tell me about your grandparents, and have any of them ever been diagnosed with cancer, um, some of those individuals will actually say that they had a close family member who was also diagnosed with a brain tumor. And so we have been actively studying some of those families. And if any of you on the line are involved in the gliogene studies, we thank you very much for your involvement. And um, we appreciate you being willing to be involved in research. Um, and we are moving towards um, identification of a, lo a, a location on the genome that we think maybe there's an inherited mutation for a small number of families. And but what we've been able to show from the epidemiologic data um, is that um, individuals that have a glioma, that their family members may also be at risk for getting a glioma. Um, but we don't know right now what genes are possibly involved with that risk. That's something we're trying to figure out. And so when we are looking for genes that cause cancer, we can do this in two different ways. We can use families, and this is the gliogene study that I was talking about, where, um, and this right here is a pedigree. I don't know if any of you have ever seen an actual pedigree drawn out, but the way to understand the pedigree is that the circles are females and the squares are males, 
And anybody who's linked by a bar means that they are related. So if you just focus right here, ooh, see, I clicked, sorry about that. If you just focus right here on this part of the pedigree, this is dad, this is mom, and they have three children, two daughters and one son. Okay? So hopefully that makes a little sense. So if you're looking at things online and you see a drawing of a pedigree, or if you've ever talked with a genetic counselor and they've drawn your family pedigree, it will help you better understand what's going on there. So, you know, the challenge with um, doing family studies is that um, sometimes what happens is, is that one family or a small grouping of families will have a very specific um, potential mutation associated with their risk that really is not applicable to other families with that cancer, okay? Again, the one, the one um, mutation that's inherited that's very much more broadly applicable to breast and ovarian cancer patients is, are the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations where they can actually be tested and they can calculate a risk. Unfortunately, we, do, we are not there yet for brain tumors, but we are, we are trying very hard with our studies, our international collaborations through the gliogene study. The other types of studies that we talked about already are something called the case control study, where, again, the cases are individuals diagnosed with the, the brain tumor and controls are individuals that don't have the brain tumor. And just like we were able to compare the um, different sorts of environmental exposures between cases and controls and understand whether those were associated with a risk of brain tumors, we can also compare their genetics from their blood between cases and controls and look to see if there's anything um, in their genetics that's associated with risk of a brain tumor. So one thing I was telling you about was a gliogene study, which was supported by multiple grants, including some money that came, um, and we're very grateful, from the American Brain Tumor Association, where families with two or more gliomas diagnosed in the family were recruited. And um, there have been two studies that have been um, published so far. And um, they have found that for some of these families that they are linked to in a very particular location on chromosome 17. And we are now in the process of looking further under the, in that area on chromosome 17 to see if we can identify the actual gene where the mutation is. So stay tuned. And this is just showing you the difference. This is chromosome 17 here going across the chromosome left to right on your screen. And you can see that this is a fairly large peak here. Um, and this is the initial paper's peak was right here, and then the second paper's peak was over here. And just to give you an idea of how big this is, this is in um, Morgan, which is a, a unit of measure uh, used in genetics. And it's about 50 centimorgans, which probably includes it includes thousands of genes. And so it's going to take us a little more time to figure out exactly what genes are under these peaks to try to better understand and then go back and look in the families um, if those genes are actually relevant. Okay? So the, the large case control studies that we do um, where we look at genetic risk factors are called genome-wide association studies. And we found um, multiple different uh, markers of multiple different chromosomes. This is chromosome nomenclature. So what it means is chromosome 9. P means the petite arm or small arm. All chromosomes have um, a petite arm or a P arm and then a long arm, which is called Q, with a centromere in the middle. And then it's telling you what band of the chromosome it's on. So, um, this is a gene on 9P. Uh, this is a gene right here on the long arm of chromosome 20. We've also found um, genes that are different between cases and controls um, on the long arm of chromosome 8. Again, a different gene on the short arm of chromosome 9 and the long arm of chromosome 11. And what this graph is showing you is if you put all of these together, right, it's between all these different genes, there's nine different 
risk, um, risk variants that you can have. So these are just single letter flips in your genome. So your genome is made up of billions of letters, and it's the same four letters repeated over and over and over and over again. It's A, C, T, and G. And what these genome-wide association studies look for is they look for a single uh, letter change. Okay? So these studies confirmed that there were nine single letter changes involved in these genes right here that were associated with risk of a brain tumor. And you can see that um, it's very few individuals that have seven out of nine of those letter changes. The vast majority of the individuals have somewhere between three and six of those letter changes. And um, it does increase your risk um, of development of a brain tumor with the more of these letter changes you have, OK? So by the time you get to, if you have six of those letter changes, you have a two-fold increased risk of development of a brain tumor, OK? But for those individuals out here that have seven of these letter changes or eight of these letter changes, you can see over here it's, very, it's a very small proportion of the individuals included in these studies. And these studies include thousands of cases and thousands of controls. So what about prognostic vectors? Like we talked about, epidemiologists not only study risk factors for um, development of brain tumors, but we also study factors that are associated with survival or other clinical outcomes. The um, known prognostic factors that, that, that we know of are the histological type of brain tumor that you have, so is it an astrocytoma, an oligodendroglioma, a meningioma, um, the extent of your surgical resection, so how much of the tumor did the, did the doctor get out, and that's what this graph over here shows you. It's a relatively old paper from 2001. But what it shows you is individuals who have greater than 98% of their tumor resected um, do a little bit better than those that had less than 98% resected. Um, age at diagnosis is definitely associated with um, clinical outcomes. And, and age at diagnosis is associated with clinical outcomes for all cancers, not just specific to brain tumors. And then something called Karnofsky Performance Score, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, it's a measurement on a 0 to 100 scale by 10 that basically asks the fundamental question, how well are you doing in daily life? And there's also some very, very interesting work that's been done looking at quality of life and other different um, depression and anxiety measurements and that these may or may not be associated with prognosis, but it's looking like um, the literature is becoming more and more clear that they are associated. And then there's some, something called a biomarker. And in this case, um, these biomarkers are derived from the tumors that are taken out. And we look at different um, genetic changes that occur in the tumors. And we try to look to see if those are associated with clinical outcomes. So just giving you a little bit of data, again, from the Central Brain Tumor Registry for the United States on survival um, over time for brain tumors. And so what about these biomarkers for brain tumors? I think that this is really where the next frontier is. It's very exciting. And um, there have been multiple biomarkers that have been um, found to be associated with um, response to treatment, both chemotherapy and radiotherapy, or improved survival for brain tumor patients. So um, the ones that most people talk about and believe to be true are MGMT methylation. MGMT is a DNA repair gene. So um, if the DNA repair genes are working correctly, when the chemotherapy and or radiotherapy comes in to damage the DNA, then these genes will go and repair that damage. Methylation is something called an epigenetic phenomena. And what it means is, is if a gene is methylated, it means it's turned off. So in this case, if MGMT is methylated, it means that that DNA repair mechanism is turned off, OK? Um, and then losses of chromosome 1P and 19Q, especially for oligodendrogliomas. And then some of the most latest work has been done in IDH1 and IDH2 mutations. Um, 
While these are present in all gliomas, they are most common in who grade 2 and grade 3 gliomas. Um, they're relatively uncommon in glioblastoma. And then also something called a DNA methylator phenotype. So we already talked about MGMT methylation. Again, methylation means that the gene has been turned off. When we look at the tumor at a broader level for methylation, we can see that there's a turning off pattern or a turning on pattern across, across the genome for these tumors. And for those that have this, this turning off pattern across the whole genome, they have better survival. So this is just showing you a little data um, taken from some of the studies that um, looked at some of the biomarkers. The thing to focus on, I think, over here is the survival curve that shows you that individuals who had methylated MGMT, so turned off MGMT, had better overall survival. And um, here for individuals who had oligodendrogliomas, that those that had loss of one piece of the short arm of one and the long arm of um, 19 had the best survival. And then this is showing you just some data on the IDH1 and IDH2 mutations. The important thing to focus on here is what value is included here in the parentheses. And this is showing you the grade of the tumor that was tested. If you look in um, primary glioblastoma, the grade 4 tumors, you can see that very few of them had IDH1 mutations, whereas if you look over here for the grade 2 and grade 3, it's relatively common. And IDH1 is a, um, a gene that's involved in cell metabolism. Okay, and these just again show you that for those individuals who are, um, have the IDH1 mutation that they seem to have increased in survival. Some very, very interesting data that's been coming out um, there's a more recent paper than the ones that I'm quoting here, but um, these are really the core papers that, that have now been confirmed in a new paper from the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, which is a very large undertaking by the National Cancer Institute to fully molecularly characterize multiple different cancer types, including glioblastomas and grade 2 and grade 3 gliomas. Um, and this is just showing you that you can take gene expression um, where red means upregulated gene expression and green means downregulated gene expression, and that you can break glioblastomas into four distinct groups based on their gene expression profiles. And um, in, in some studies, these gene expression um, groups have been associated with different clinical outcomes as well. And then this is the methylation profiling. Um, these are the individuals right here shown with this little red bar that have the hypermethylator phenotype. So that they have a lot of red, which means that they have um, increased methylation. So they have an increased um, number of genes across the genome that have been turned off. And they're shown right here in this line that they seem to have the best survival. Um, these are glioblastoma patients. It's only somewhere between 8 and 10 percent of all glioblastoma patients, their tumors, would have this hypermethylator phenotype. And this is the updated data from the most recent paper from the Cancer Genome Atlas. And basically what it's showing is, is that um, for individuals who are younger, who have MGMT methylation, who have an IDH1 mutation, and who have that hypermethylator phenotype, that they are all in a better, um, they have improved survival, okay? So we were able to, um, with a larger set of tumors, this, this paper now includes 500 glioblastomas, where the previous ones I showed you included about 200. We were able to show that some of these biomarkers still hold true. And this is very exciting because these biomarkers are now being more widely used um, by physicians, and they're being used in clinical trials to help um, stratify patients. And so it's very exciting that we've gotten to this point where we have something that can actually be looked at and that could be important for um, clinical outcomes. Um, so this is all, all of this stuff that we've talked about so far related to genetics is sort of summarized on this um, 
paper, and this is something that's just come out called the World Cancer Report, and there's a chapter on brain tumors in that report. And um, this is showing you as you go from uh, grade one to a grade four tumor, all the different types of genomic changes that we know occur and the time frame that these occur in. Um, it's important to note that there is a difference in what is what is thought to be a primary glioblastoma versus a secondary glioblastoma. And the important thing to remember is that when people talk about secondary glioblastomas, what they mean is that it started out as a lower grade glioma and it over time turned into um, a grade four tumor. And so this is my team at Case Western. I, I, I know that they enjoy being shown to you guys. They do lots of hard work and are involved in everything and are very, very dedicated to helping me find something um, that's important for brain tumors. And I thank them very much. And um, just to give you some web resources for some of the different um, studies and data that we've talked about in today's webinar. Um, so this gives you that information. You can look up lots of different things. Um, the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States Report, where it has our annual report that gives all the statistics on brain tumors. Um, the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Program is the National um, Cancer Registry Program. So if you're interested in brain tumors or any other type of cancer statistics, you can look here. For the American Cancer Society, they also publish a facts and figures every year. And their facts and figures are based off of these other uh, resources plus other resources um, state resources for data, and then the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, which we just talked about. So I thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, just so everyone knows, half of the APTA staff is here listening to it as well, so um, it's a wonderful presentation. Now, just a reminder, if you have questions, Type them into the question box, hit enter, and then we'll get through as many questions as we can um, that uh, Dr. Broadhouse Float can answer. Um, our first question is, could the herpes virus cause brain tumors? Uh, yes, thank you for bringing that up. So, um, and I apologize that I didn't include that because I, I said before we started on talking about the risk factors that I was going to talk about some that had received recent press, and you are absolutely on the mark for asking that question because um, uh, the CMV virus and the herpes virus very recently have gotten some attention. Um, I think that, it, at least in my opinion, um, in, in reading some of those studies, um, you know, there are flaws in those study designs. Um, that I'm not sure, you know, could be bringing in some, some biases into those studies um, that may or may not make the conclusions from those studies um, totally accurate. I, I should say that as the first thing. The second is, is that um, in terms of the herpes virus, I do not believe that there's any um, definitive literature out there that the herpes virus causes brain tumors, I think you have to remember that the important thing about viruses is, and the important thing about the brain, is that not everything gets into the brain, right? Which is really important, um, because we don't want all these crazy viruses that are going around and infections going around to be able to get into our brain. Your brain has lots of protective mechanisms in place. And so the thing about a lot of these viruses is a lot of times um, when they go to look at brain tissue, um, it's not actually present in the brain tissue. So, and I can't remember about the herpes virus, whether or not they found it to be present in the brain tissue. I know with the CMV virus that they did find it to be present in brain tissue, and that was some of the reasoning for trying to look to see if it was associated with brain tumor risk. But again, those studies have been very inconclusive. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of questions about what about my children, um, if there already is one or more patients in the family that have a brain tumor, where do they get them tested, how do they ask for this, 
just can you go over the basics again for um, any family? So I think it's important to remember that um, only about 5% of all brain tumors are actually inherited from mom or dad. Okay, so I know it's really frightening to look at your family and to say, I've got this cancer and this cancer and this cancer and, you know, in my family and could it be possible that I could pass on something to my child. Um, I know that that's really frightening, but it happens in a very small number of, of very small proportion of brain tumors are, are actually inherited. Okay, that's the first thing. The second is, I think if you have questions about it, and you want to talk to someone about it, there are people who are trained specifically to talk to you about this question. Um, there are medical doctors who are trained specifically. They're called medical geneticists, okay? That's the term. And usually they have people who work with them called genetic counselors. And my recommendation to you would be to either ask your um, primary care provider or the physician that you're seeing on a regular basis right now, so if you're in the middle of treatment and you're seeing the radiation oncologist or the neuro-oncologist or the neurosurgeon, um, to say to them that you are concerned about your family history and you would like that for them to make a referral to a medical geneticist and or a genetic counselor for you. Okay. Uh, there's two questions regarding brain tumors and head injuries. Um, is there any correlation? So the um, studies that have looked at head injuries and whether or not head injuries are associated with increased risk of brain tumors have shown no association. You can't get any clearer than that. Thank you. Um, and. I'm sorry, I just drew a blank there. Um, can you repeat your email address? Um, there's people who want to know how to contact you. I know it's on the first slide, but if you yeah, could just repeat sure. it, that'd be great. Sure. It's J, S as in Sam, B as in boy, the number four, the number two, and then the at symbol, case, which is spelled C as in Charlie, A as in apple, S as in Sam, E as in elephant, and then the period, dot, E-D-U. E as an elephant, D as in dog, U as in umbrella. Thank you. You um, can also, if you, if you um, Google my name, my website should come up too, and my email address is on my website. Perfect. And you can also call us here um, on our care line at 800-886-2282 or email us at Cares. Um, we can also um, give you the information after the presentation is over, too. Um, someone wanted to know about alcohol consumption. Can that cause brain tumors? So we have looked at um, both alcohol consumption and smoking because I think um, everyone is probably aware of the very strong association between smoking and lung cancer risk, right? Um, but all of the studies that have looked at alcohol use or smoking have not found any association with uh, brain tumor risk. So like I said from the beginning, it's, I wish that I could tell you that there was a big whopping risk factor that we knew about that we could then tell you not to do, um, but there just isn't for brain tumors. We just don't have one of those, um, you know, Yes, we believe ionizing radiation to the head or neck to be a risk factor, a definitive risk factor for brain tumors, but it's a very small proportion of people that get ionizing radiation to the head or neck. So it just doesn't explain the large amount of brain tumors that are, brain tumor patients that are out there. And we unfortunately just don't have that answer yet. But we are, we continue to try to find that answer, and I'm hopeful that we can. I think we all are. Um, someone's asking if you could <clears throat> repeat the name of the brain tumor epidemiology organization that you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation. Oh, so so I mentioned two different ones. Um, the first was um, the the 
organization and the source of all the statistics on brain tumors that I was showing, and it's called CBTRUST, C-B-T-R-U-S, and what that stands for is the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States. And the other one that I mentioned is the International Group of Brain Tumor Epidemiologists that um, meet once a year. I'm actually the, um, the current U.S. president for that, and it's called the Brain Tumor Epidemiology Consortia, or BTEC, B-T-E-C. Thank you. Can I um, type? If I type in here, they can't see what I'm typing, right? No. Okay. But, um, again, if they... If they email us or call us on our care line, um, then we can share the information um, with them after sure. the and, call. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, CB Trust has a website, uh, BTAC has a website, the gliogene study, the, the family study that I talked about has a website. So I will make sure that ABTA has all of that information so that if you guys were to call their care line, they would be able to provide you with that. And obviously, if you if you email me, I can give you that information as well. Thank you for offering to do that. We appreciate that. Um, I know you mentioned different uh, things that you've looked at: cell phones, radiation, um, wires. Are they looking at them separate? Someone has a question: If what if they're exposed to multiple of these types of risk factors? Does that has that been studied as a whole or all just studied separately? So in general, they're usually all studied um, separately. Um, and if we don't find anything separately, then we usually don't move, you know, forward with it. But I can tell you, you know, to look at it in conjunction with other things unless we have some sort of reasoning for doing that. But there are um, a series of studies that have tried to look at different types of exposure to electromagnetic fields and other types of, um, you know, radiation sources all together and, again, really haven't found anything um, conclusive. Um, the one area that I didn't talk about at all are occupational exposures, so things that you would be exposed to at your job. Um, and there's a whole series of literature that looked at different occupations and the different things that you would be exposed to at that job um, and risk of brain tumors. And there's nothing definitive out there, um, unfortunately, about any, having any specific job being associated with brain tumors. But for those occupational studies, they definitely account for all the different things that you could have been exposed to at each of those different jobs. Thank you. There's a question uh, about the emotional aspects of worrying about inheriting it or um, being exposed to things that would cause a brain tumor. What do you say to people that every time they get a headache, they worry that they might be getting the same brain tumor as their father, brother, or sister? So I think in terms of Worrying about potential exposures, um, I think, unfortunately, as you can see, we really don't have, you know, the only definitive risk factor that we have that increases your risk is ionizing radiation to the head or neck. So I would hope that that would ease your worry about uh, worrying about environmental, you know, exposures. I think in terms of worrying about your family, um, I still would really recommend that you talk with your physician about going to see a medical geneticist or a genetic counselor because um, this is what these people are trained to do. They're trained to talk to you about these types of questions and to help you work through them so that you don't have to, um, you know, suffer with, with the anxiety. And you shouldn't have to. So I would really, really recommend that you, you try to um, talk to your doctor about giving a recommendation for you to see someone in your area. Thank you. Uh, what about exposure to radon gas? So 
exposure to radon gas, I believe, and I apologize because I don't know the um, I don't know the occupational literature probably as best as as well as some of my colleagues do. Um, but radon gas, obviously, you can be exposed to in your home, depending on where you live in the country, right? Um, and there are higher levels of radon in the ground, depending on where you are. And then also you can be exposed to it, I believe, at certain occupations. In terms of the exposure um, from certain occupations, there's nothing that's been linked to radon gas specifically that I know of. Um, the same goes for potential exposure in your home. Nothing has been linked to brain tumor risk that I'm aware of. But if you, uh, whoever that is that asked that question, if you want to email me, I can maybe look in the literature a little bit more. I'm just not as familiar um, with that. But, but nothing, I mean, I, I know all the occupational brain tumor epidemiologists, and we're, we're just writing some review papers, and there was nothing in those review papers about radon gas. So I think if there was something there, they would have included it. I would hope so. Uh, questions about mono or questions about Lyme disease? Any, anything you know about those two related to brain tumors? Well, so again, those are infections, right? And I think the important thing to realize is that um, your brain is, very, is a very special part of your body um, that has a lot of protective mechanisms in place beyond just your skull that's, you know, covering it. Um, and a lot of these infections, even though, um, you know, they make you feel awful, they make your whole body feel awful, they may or may not actually get into the brain. And so that's the important thing I think you have to remember when thinking about infections. But there's nothing that I know of that has looked at either of those in terms of their relationship with brain tumors. And if they have, then there's no evidence that shows that they are. Here's an interesting question. Can having a brain tumor diagnosis make you more prone to develop MS? That's a very interesting question. I think, um, you know, MS, like brain tumors, is relatively uncommon. Um, I think, you know, when you look, and what I mean by that is, just to, to, quali to put that in perspective for everybody, what I mean by the term uncommon is if you look at all of the cancers that are diagnosed in the United States on an annual basis, um, almost 80% of all cancers diagnosed in the United States can be classified as one of the big four, breast, colon, prostate, and lung. Okay? So that means that the remaining 20% of, of cancer diagnoses in the U.S. Um, fit, um, you know, could be anywhere else in the body. And so brain tumors are included in that, that other 20%, and they only make up about 1% of all cancer diagnoses in the U.S. So they really are very uncommon. And I don't know the incidence rate of, of MS, but it, it is very uncommon as well. And so um, the two of those things, being linked together. I'm not sure that anyone has actually studied that because I don't know if, if you look at the brain tumor, the large brain tumor studies, whether or not they've even had anybody who also had MS in those studies. Or if they did, it was so few people that it would not have made a study uh, meaningful. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. We've had so many submitted, but we are actually out of time. Um, so the one question at the end I'm going to fit in is, could growth hormones of the child contribute to an adult diagnosis of a glioblastoma? So there's no evidence that it does, um, that I'm aware of, um, but I'm not sure that I'm not sure anyone knows the answer to that question right now. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Sparrow Sloan. 
Um, we do have your questions, and with the information um, that you can send us, we will try to answer all the questions um, to the people that have posted them and we haven't gotten to them yet. We apologize. We know this is a really important topic and creates a lot of question and dialogue. So we appreciate um, you all staying on the line and uh, for presenting this. Um, sure. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. And again, um, if I can help, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do so. I would really appreciate that. Um, so let's pause just for a moment, and we are going to conclude our webinar recording.